So maybe um, as we're waiting, um, I know a couple of folks from ID Lab joined and, and the reason is we're really interested in kind of hearing the conversation. Um, so maybe Rajis, you can do a quick intro. Matt and Patrick, is that Patrick St. Louis, Patrick? Yeah, it's the one. Cool. <laughs> Sorry, I had to update Zoom. Uh, it took me a while to come in. No worries. So maybe um, you can each uh, give a 10 second intro and then um, I'm sure we might be able to start then. Regis? Sure. I'm Regis. I'm the director of Cloud Services at ID Lab and I've been at ID Lab for over two years now. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Patrick, do you want to go next? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm Patrick. I work at ID Lab. Uh, Sorry, I just adjust my webcam. I've been working here for around two years now. There we go. Uh, I'm on the DevOps, DevOps team uh, here, so DevOps and Digital ID. So I've been uh, experimenting with various technology and I've been sort of trying to brainstorm this digital test bench that we are working on. So uh, I'm very excited to see the, the discussion we will have today. Awesome, and Matt? Yeah, I'll uh, clean up and sorry, uh, Zoom is not cooperating with me as well. I can't figure out how to get the camera to work on this computer. Uh, so apologies for that, but I'm Matt McNeil. I'm Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement here at the lab. Uh, basically what that means is I, I oversee our partnerships, uh, marketing programs, outreach, uh, community engagement, stuff like that. So happy to be here and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, on behalf of the entire working group, I think, um, we're really happy to have you here. We're grateful for you for uh, uh, being willing to come and present about your experience with testing interoperability. Um, I think we're at a good point to go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll turn it over to you, Bonnie. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'll do a, a quick intro of myself. So I'm Bonnie. I am the, I'm the VP of Service Enablement at the IT Lab. Um, I wear a few hats. So one of them is I take care of some of the technology initiatives um, that we have. And, and primarily one of our focus areas um, is interoperability. And we are, we've been learning along the way. I'd say we're still scratching the surface, and which is why I think conversations like this are great, because we can um, share some of our thinking, you know, be challenged, be corrected, you know, be augmented. Um, so I, that's what I'm really looking for. So I'm going to put out things out there that might, might sound awesome or might sound silly. And I love for you to just share your feedback. And so we can improve our thinking. All right. So let me oh, fix this and I will get started. <clears throat> All right. So a little bit about ID Lab. Um, if you don't know us already, we're um, you know an independent nonprofit organization, and you see that you know on the slide here. My slides don't have a lot of words, but this this one does. So here we're dedicated to accelerating ethical digital trust through a community based approach, right? So some of the things that we do include solving complex problems um, related to digital trust. And this is really, you know, importantly through collaboration with community folks like yourselves. And we empower pan-Canadian conversations through research. So, of course, because we're Canadian-based, um, Canadian endeavors are um, near and dear to our heart. And we support a lot of those efforts through both pu public and private sector collaboration. And last but not least, we also explore the social effects of digital identity through some of the research that we do as well. So bottom line, we help realize ethical digital trust for Canada and also for the world. Um, a really simple way to think about it is, you know, we, we look for digital identity barriers by listening to the community, and we also endeavor to find ways to remove them, uh, again, with the passionate folks around the table from the community. So here you can see by show of logos, um, we collaborate both with public and private sector organizations, as mentioned, and also many industry groups. Um, and if along the way you see an opportunity to collaborate with us, don't hesitate to reach out. We're, we're really happy to chat and learn more. So today, um, uh, this is actually the first time I'm presenting, presenting this material, so we can go as quickly or as slowly as, as we want. Um, I think my primary goal here is to really 
have a conversation. So, ha- you know, feel free to jump in. There really are two parts. So if we need to, we can split it up. Um, the first part today and then the next part another day. Um, let's play it by year if everyone's okay with that. But again, I, I would really look forward to conversation and feedback along the way. So first one is about our journey and a bit of our learnings, and then we'll switch gears to the second part, which is a hypothesis we have, a hypothesis we have, and some of the ideas that support the hypothesis. So I guess um, you know there's the big question of what is interoperability, and I think when we started out, we thought. Yeah, there must be a definition written somewhere, and of course there isn't, um, but there are many ways to define interoperability. So, um, you know, sharing our thinking process. So since digital identity by nature relies on technology and some level of connect- connectivity, we we started by looking at it more technically. So, for example, let's look at IEEE. Um, what their definition is, and it's the ability of two or more systems or components to exchange information and to use that information that has been exchanged. So when I reflect on that, okay, it's it's about technical things, you know, it's it's about exchanging data or information and then doing something with that. And of course we want that to be some type of useful exercise. And so, so that's great, that's kind of a start. And then if we think that's a little bit too specific or too technical, we can also break down the word. Um, So let's look at what inter means. Okay, that means between. Um, Operability, that refers to the quality of being capable of functioning. Okay, well, that kind of, you know, give us a a, a better um, set of insights into what, what it actually might mean. But ultimately, I think if I internalize all of that, I think, It's about being able to collaborate um, to achieve a common goal. Um, It's also about doing that with minimal effort and with efficiency. Um, And ultimately, it's to create the most optimal experience for the user and whoever that user might be. Um, So this, there isn't really a, you know, I think there isn't a universal definition. There are definitions in different contexts, but again, it's very contextual. So at ID Lab, where we're at is we're we're really challenging ourselves to get better at defining this as we approach different contexts. And in all of these contexts, we're going to think about what it means to the user first and foremost. And so, you know, for that particular thing, what does interoperability look like for to the particular user at hand? So that's kind of where we're at. So, you know, no specific definition we want to put on the slide, but that's sort of the thinking process when it comes to um, what we think um, this, this actually means to us and to the community. So I think the second thing we wanted to explore was, well, why does it even matter, right? So notionally, I think we all agree that um, interop is a good thing. And for me personally, things become a lot more tangible when I can draw a parallel to something. So for example, when I think about making a phone call, it's something I take for granted. I pick up the phone and I call somebody. I don't really have to think about, is this number gonna work? And you know, is is something gonna be broken? Do I need to use a different telephone? You don't have to think about those things, right? And I think funny enough, this might actually be something that's so mature that it might go away in our lifetime, you know, just like, you know, VHS and, you know, other technologies from the past. Um, And then I also think about credit cards, right? It's generally all I need to have to pay for something, um, at least, you know, in my neighborhood. But there's always that one time where I'm proven wrong, where I I walk out uh, with just a credit card and I regret it because there's some vendor that doesn't accept it. So now, you know, focus, no, notice that I'm focusing on my own experience as a person, and I'm I'm kind of purposely blind to all the nitty gritty that's behind the scenes, the government, uh, the governance, the tech. Um, you know, we can think about people, process, tools, and likely a lot of different aspects that are the backbone of how these, um, you know, mature industries have achieved interoperability. So I think I'm, you know, being somewhat ignorant of all this detail is very helpful. And I'll touch on this a little bit later. So after all, why does it matter? So for us, I think it boils down to um, the fact that it creates a positive user experience. Um, There's collaboration 
and and all of this kind of happens in a cycle to um, to drive one another, right? So the collaboration from the community leading to better user experience, leading to better adoption, and as there's better adoption, there's more and more collaboration, and this is a very positive um, cycle that happens. And um, and in this case, I don't think it's so much a problem that we're solving. You know, usually we want to come up with a problem statement. But I think in this case, it's more about cultivating an opportunity. And again, the opportunity here is to promote better collaboration, is to create better user experiences, and to accelerate adoption. So with this, it, it kind of all leads me to the thought of, well, maybe interop is when the user no longer needs to think about um, what, you know, how to do that thing. And it, they generally take it for granted, right? As in the case of me picking up the phone or using my credit card, I don't really think too much about it. It just it just works. So that's kind of where we're at. We're at. Any any thoughts on that? Any do you guys feel the same way, or do you guys look at it very differently? Happy to to take some uh, questions or thoughts at this time. I think it's uh, I really like the analogies, you know, I think we live in a time that we've had a lot of system being built and uh, being interoperable. So I think it's not necessarily a matter of following the same path that was taken before, but we can learn from these experiences to be more uh, proactive about interoperability. And even though, um, like you said, we're not in a situation that there is yet a problem for interoperability, I think it's good to know that it might come at some point and be proactive about this and uh, yeah i think it's great uh, great analogy cool thank you so i will move on here so then a little bit about our journey so how did we even get to doing this thinking and and you know the blurb that i just shared with everyone so uh, you know so there's kind of three i think key events um, or experiences that we have as a lab. So, so the first one around uh, assessments and independent testing. So when the lab was founded, our big focus was to provide testing and assessment services to the community. And when we were investigating some of the frameworks for testing and also ways to automate the delivery mechanism, because if we're offering a service, we, we need to make it efficient. Um, you know, that's when it kind of piqued our interest. So that was at the very beginning. Then along the way, as we were engaging more and more with the communities, we saw a strong appetite for testing, right? There were people approaching us to say, hey, you know, we know there isn't a standard per se, but there's, you know, this spec for a certain technology, you know, it would be great if we have someone, you know, a third party distant from us that can, that can do some independent, independent testing and to let us know how we're doing and, and whether we're, you know, tracking in the right direction. So that's great. That's, that's nice demand. And, and that's, that's good feedback from the community. But the tests and the assessment frameworks are, you know, have yet to mature. And there are some tools that do exist. For example, there are test suites out there, but they're not always easy to use. So ultimately there's, there's a huge learning curve um, for those that are involved. There are people who are very well versed and those are, you know, sort of the experts in each of the, the tech stacks, like they might be the people who are creating the test suite, so on and so forth. Um, but for for the layperson or for somebody new to digital identity, it's it's really it's mind boggling and it's a huge learning curve. Um, so in this case, because of that, it's challenging for organizations to prioritize this work because they're still busy trying to design and build a solution that they're building to solve the problem that they want to solve for the for the uh, for the market. So that's where we also saw a gap where, you know, there's some some stuff which is going to take time. And there are tools, but there's so much more that can 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 happen to make things easier. So that was sort of the, the second phase of that. And then most recently, and this is actually still ongoing, we've been collaborating with the Canadian government um, to pave the road for interop for digital credentials. And the work that we're doing with them is a is part of a it's part of something called Innovative Solutions Canada, ISC challenge. So this is similar to um, kind of the, the the stuff that DHS in the states work on with the Silicon Valley and innovation program, similar similar thing. Um, so 
this is jointly sponsored by several federal departments who are all you know very invested in in solving for digital trust and digital identity so they include for example treasury board tbs um esdc which is the employment and social development canada i said i sorry i said which is innovation science and economic development canada and also shared services canada so collectively they sponsor these types of engagements, uh, these types of challenges. And the goal here is to kickstart the interoperability journey um, in support of the vendors that run through these various programs. Um, but of course, more broadly, it's really to, there's a broader vision to empower our citizens in the digital economy. And by creating, um, so the work that we did was basically creating an initial set of interoperability guiding principles and this actually evolved a little bit at the beginning. They were thinking more about technical testing. Um, but in the end, they realized that, you know what, let's kind of, you know, start with the foundations. Let's think about what are these principles, even though they're not expected to be testable per se, but it's a good start um, on this journey. So we're able to learn from um, putting together these guiding principles, working with a couple of the vendors, to do um, an assessment on their solution and, and how it meets some of these um, different principles and what are what might be some of the gaps that they can look into improving upon. Um, so we're able to learn from this and also contribute to our, and through this, we want to contribute to the international counterparts or, but also back to the community as well that all of us take part in. So having said all of that, you know, going through the two, two or three years of, of uh, the life of the lab, what did we actually learn? So I'm going to summarize a few learnings here. So the first one, it's, uh, you know, interop is, is sort of a bunch of puzzle pieces, right? And, and uh, you know, it's just this massive puzzle. And there are many um, ways to slice and dice this, this, this thing called interop. So first there are layers. So for example, there's you know, governance technology and we can reference the work done by TOIP as an example. There's you know, different layers like legal, organizational, semantic um, and technical, right? And these types of layers are often referenced in, you know, as I mentioned, the existing industries that have reached interrupt. So for example, um, I think that's one that's used by communications, but we're starting to see that um, pop up in the digital trust space as well. There are also building blocks. So there are design principles, architecture specs, interop, right? And of course there are standards, sorry, standards is a big piece of the puzzle. Um, and there are various views on the ideal characteristics of what these standards look like. You know, it needs to be open because, you know, it's more agile, it's more collaborative. It needs to be ISO because, you know, of the rigorous process. It needs to be royalty free, you know, for, so that it's more accessible. So I think all of these are are valuable um, characteristics, and I'm in a way I'm kind of curious, you know, what does this look like in today's kind of pace of technology, right? What's the right mix, um, given? You know, today all technology moves very fast. You know, people are constantly innovating. Things are changing all the time. You know, can we afford a long, rigorous process? But if we go to um, agile and collaborative, not collaborative is always good. But if we go to agile, are we missing some of the rigor? So I think there's a ba balance to be struck. And I, I'm not a, a standards expert by any chance. So I'm, I'm really interested in looking to see how, how this evolves in the, in the industry. Um, and then also there are different aspects that make up the overall use case, right? So again, going back to the user, thinking about the whole user journey, the whole you know, use case and how it flows, um, you know, we get different technical components um, that you know, come out of, of these communities to handle these different concerns. So again, those are different puzzle pieces of this of this interrupt picture. So when we put all of these layers and building blocks um, into context, um, I think we also need to define scope and boundaries, right? So are we considering some part, some sort of a localized, you know, interoperability within a particular problem space? Or are we striving for broad-based, you know, widespread interoperability, which, you know, I think it's 
you know, a ways away, but, you know, they're, you know, we're open to people with their different thinking and, and different visions. And, you know, there's lots of great minds in the industry on this topic. Um, so I'll, I think, you know, bottom line is we believe there is value in incremental improvements in all of these various puzzle pieces. And, and funny enough, when I was looking for this image, there is, you know, all these puzzle pieces images, but this one was interesting because it's all over the place, but they're kind of piles, right? They're, they're kind of grouped, you know, by color or whatever. And, and, and that's, that's kind of how I see it. It's, there's all these puzzle pieces, but they're in groups, right? They're kind of loosely piled together and you're starting to see how this puzzle comes together. And, and that's kind of how I would, um, you know, kind of qualify where things are right now. So we, you know, like I said, we we believe there's incremental value in in kind of building up on uh, different things. Maybe it's a top down approach, maybe it's a bottom up or something in between. But in any case, there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a great community behind it to do all this work. So which is which is great. So the second one um, is about you know paths, right? Especially when I think about the innovators out in the market who are solving different problems in different industries with digital trust, digital identity. Um, and there are probably as many paths as there are to creative minds out there. Um, one thing that comes to mind recently, um, our team was watching um, the video from Continuum Loop. It was, it was sort of their um, roundup of 2022 year in review type of video. And um, Daryl talked about how they advised their clients to find their path, right? And and the starting point would would be a single stack, uh, single tech stack um, within the the confines of a single uh, ecosystem or industry or use case, what context, whatever you you want to call that boundary, and and that would be kind of the smart place to start, and and that's in fact where things are right now. Um, and then from that, from, you know, learning from that and getting familiar with that, then they can decide, do we want to move to either a multiple stacks, single ecosystem scenario, or do they want to go to a multiple ecosystem, but sticking with the single stack so that there's a nice kind of, you know, decision point of, do I move to multiple ecosystem or do I move to uh, multiple stacks? And then ultimately down the line, Yes, you know, we can think about a world where there's multiple stack, multiple ecosystems um, if there's a need and, and when the time comes, right? So I think that was a nice way to, to kind of summarize, you know, one, one um, way of thinking about, you know, how, how you move on this journey. And then also in our work with the government of Canada, as I mentioned earlier, we also saw that there are, you know, many different ways to bridge for um, interoperability, right? So it might be that, you know, there are two technologies and, and a vendor finds a way to create a custom or proprietary adapter between the two, right? It might be that the community is working on some type of generally accepted adapter between two stacks. So we see those patterns, right? And then also maybe it's, you know, align, aligning on a given stack, right? For two vendors or two solutions to say, oh, you know what, we're just gonna stick to this particular interop profile or this particular stack. So those are all, I think, you know, val valid ways of going about it. We also saw firsthand that there's different value um, being created um, from different facets of, of interop depending on the nature of the problem being addressed, right? So for example, when we were doing the evaluation based on the, the the draft guiding principles, applying it to a B2C use case was was more straightforward because of the fact that we were thinking of an individual user. But then when we were applying to a B2B um, use case where the user is a employee or the organization, you know, there were a lot of bits missing, right? So that was a learning where, you know, it, it, we really need to think about it in context with what is it that we're talking about, the problem, the solution is trying to solve. And then, of course, there's also nuances uh, within specific industries. So those are all, you know, again, I think there are a lot of folks that talk about this, but for us, we really needed to kind of touch it and feel it to to really understand what it means and how can we actually help um, by seeing it firsthand. So the takeaway here is we need to keep an open mind 
that there will be many ways and many paths uh, for vendors to go and for you know solution uh, kind of problem solvers in the industry to go. And they will also transition from one path to another, you know, throughout the journey. Um, so that that's just something that we have come to terms with and, and is something we're thinking about as we um, engage in solving some of these problems or enabling some of the opportunities out there. And then the last learning I want to cover off is that, you know, interop is a team sport. It's really not something anyone can do alone. Like there's no interop if you, you know, kind of test alone in, you know, in your room by yourself. Um, and it's going to be a slow and gradual achievement. And there's a lot of good efforts out there um, tackling the various layers and building blocks that I mentioned earlier. And this is great. This is amazing. Um, there are patterns we can follow, right? Back to what Patrick mentioned, you know, there's things that we can learn. Um, so, you know, all the great work on frameworks, architecture, standards, all of that is much needed. I think in parallel, there's also a need to you know, maybe be a little bit blind again, like be a little bit blind to all the nitty gritty and the details of how things have been done or how things are done um, and, and boil things down to the bits, right? To the pieces and try to reimagine things a little bit. So um, so I think this is, this is starting to shape our hypothesis um, and, and we'll touch on that next. Um, so it's, you know, interop isn't something that can be forced or dictated. We, but we can create enablers to move things along, right? To help the community achieve things better, faster, and cheaper. Um, so again, that's that's something that's that's our hypothesis. We think there there's a lot we can do to become an enabler, and more and more as we're scanning things, we're hearing, um, you know phrases like interoperability first, um, interoperability by design, or interoperability as a first principle. Um, so those are, are really interesting concepts for us to noodle on to say, well, what, what does that really mean? And, and what might that look like? So again, I think this is, um, you know, a line of thinking that's really worth exploring. And that kind of takes us into, now what? So I'll pause here in case anyone wants to chime in or or discuss this a little bit. Any um any common thinking on some of the learnings? Anything you want to add? Well, if uh, if anyone wants to go, go ahead. But I could add uh, something just from uh, my personal experience. You know, being more of a on a technical side and um. You know, I, I don't participate everywhere, but I've participated in a few different sort of uh, ecosystems meeting and uh, a, a big concept that I see that is uh, everywhere is the concept of uh, tribal knowledge, meaning there's people actively engaged in a community and sometimes uh, whether it's decisions that are being made within the community, uh, they're not necessarily documented or uh, not easy to discern from something from the outside. So I think a great part of interoperability is uh, active community participation in the sector that you enjoy. And uh, again, not, not everyone can participate everywhere. Uh, but I think having a, a look at inside uh, what is being discussed and what is happening will will very help a lot uh, versus looking only from the outside. That could be for a, yeah. a test suite or a, a spec. I think that's yeah. something I not worthy. Yeah, agree. Thank you. All right. To, to, sorry, I'll, I'll chime in with a, a thought briefly. Yeah. Um, so I, I recently read, it was a summary of a report um, that was done in collaboration with the Linux Foundation on uh, open source technology and, and what caused fragmentation in open source technology. Um, and by their definition, fragmentation was a negative thing um, because it, it caused you know, inefficiencies in how things were developed. But then they also turned it around and said that fragmentation also was critical to innovation and mm. and solving problems in a creative way um so i i found having read that recently i 
found the parallels to what you're saying about interoperability to be pretty interesting. Um, uh, and kind of going off of what Patrick said as well, um, there's going to be little pockets of knowledge. There's going to be little, little tribal groups where there's not necessarily a ton of overlap between all the different groups. Um, and, and I think from a certain perspective, that can be seen as very inefficient, very undesirable. Um, but it's also an important piece that helps lead us towards, you know, arriving at, I don't know, uh, the eventually one solution that will help service uh, all of our, our needs better, hopefully. Um, mm -hmm. But then at the same time, there does need to be some collaboration, but we can't, we can't force that. We can't uh, dictate it, like you said. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I found that interesting. Thanks. I think, uh, Brent, I think you were next. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by interoperability at the governance layer? Just, that's it. So, so, um, so in, in some of the research that we did when we were coming up with the principles, um, it was almost like we expected some kind of silver bullet, some kind of answers. And I think, you know, we, and maybe I should speak for myself. You know, I was thinking it was it was something very technical and very specific, right? But as we read a lot of the materials that were available out there, some of them were at the government uh, from government public sector. Some of them were just kind of working groups, um, and there were a lot of pieces that were there were a lot of principles that were talking about the need for governance um, in order to achieve interoperability. So that's what that's kind of speaking to. It's not just Technically, are you aligned? But also from a governance level, is there alignment? Because if 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 um, there's a solution out there, there's a user that is um, you know leveraging some kind of solution, but the governance isn't also uh, cohesive or hasn't really been thought about from an interoperability perspective, then then you won't achieve it. So I I, I don't think I can speak in more detail than that, but that's kind of the notion of of why it applies. I can give a quick example. Um, one of the, the domain under governance is identity verification, identity um, verification, identity assurance levels, sorry. Uh, so in the EU, they talk about substantial and high, right? And based on the level of identity verification you've been able to conduct, it's going to mean something different about your credentials and how you can use them. So it's got nothing to do with technic the technical aspects of it but it impacts how your credentials can be used. And right now, one of the challenges in Europe is they have to reconcile their national identity access levels and how they've looked at it in the past. And now they have to come up with a uniform way to handle this across Europe. So that's an example where the challenge is not the technical one, it's more of a governance and agreeing on the terms and that things mean the same way credentials can be used in, in similar ways across borders. Thanks, Rishi. See, you're not just here for the French representation. That was a European example, though, to be fair. <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, Keith. Yeah, thank you. I, I think like the laissez-faire approach to interop is, I mean, obviously the whole world is not going to unite on a standard, but I think that there can be united, unite, you know, regions or countries or, or, or verticals can unite on a standard. And, sorry, I'm just going to throw out a Canadian example. Like one vision would be that, Canada unites on a standard and so that a person can move from one province to another and they can use their credentials. Another vision could be like BC, Ontario, Quebec use a non-creds, Alberta uses mobile driver's license, Newfoundland does something different, federal government does something different. And it's not the telephone experience you express at the beginning, it's a much more disunited experience. So I, I, I think, you know, we could speak about, yes, yeah, so there'll be many approaches around the world around identity, but within regions, it would be very disruptive if there are multiple approaches to the user experience yeah. for somebody who lives in a, a single country or a single region or operates within a single vertical industry space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and Keith, and to, to go back to a point Bonnie was making earlier, but there, there are different ways in we can achieve interoperability. The, what you're describing the situation in Canada, for example, um, we could compensate for that in by the way in which wallets are being designed, right? So wallet in theory could handle a 
and on Cred's Hyperledger Iris protocol and mobile driver's license, right? There's no reason why from a user perspective, I couldn't handle both type of credentials, both protocols within the same wallet. So doesn't mean full interoperability, but from a user perspective, it is kind of interoperable, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think this is always probably the, the comeback is that people can develop Uber verifiers, Uber wallets. I maybe I, I think it's it's it it's complex. So yeah, it is agreed. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think your point is you know sort of around the the scope and boundary, right? So what what is that boundary that we want to define? Like if it's not widespread, you know, interop all over what what is that boundary like is, is it canada is it a particular industry is it use case is it wallet you know i think you know it, there's a lot of creativity um you know around that it's it's a bit of an art and a science thanks keith um lucy thank you for the presentation i want to i have two things to respond to so one thing is about the, um, the governance or like the interoperability i think the um i think we just have um kind of um, elaborate on the problem very well. I think one thing I would like to add is, especially as we see um, the world going more decentralized and like, and I think COVID is a good example where like different jurisdictions, different countries have their own way of uh, issuing credentials and certificates. And it's getting harder to harder to get actual agreement bilaterally um, mm -hmm. to get um, governance interop. So that means like how to get interoperability in a more decentralized world. I think there's technical issues that need to be solved. I'm working on a matter of um, network and networks, and especially and still like in, in the COVID and health world, but just, just want to comment on that. It's, uh, it's, there's a technical portion to it, but essentially it's how, how as more and more players, and in Canada is the same thing, right? We have, I mean, I'm based in Toronto. <laughs> so as we, there are like different jurisdictions, right? And, and also the federal government, there are so many jurisdictions in play and have probably needs to have localized rules and regulations for things when you when you're issuing credentials how it's easier to get two probably like you know two provinces where the one province with the federal government get bilateral agreement but how like these old provinces and territories can actually you know have you know that at least in the governance level like the the interoperability it, it will be a challenge um and, and that's just one thing i want to highlight it's a little bit different i could because before we're talking uh, even in COVID world we see a lot of countries having bilateral agreements but they realize it's not it's not going to work long term right you can probably just have some temporary agreements in in place for for COVID, and but when when there are more other things that happen in the future you probably <laughs> wouldn't be able to do an agreement agreement again and again so that's um, right right so that that's one comment. Another comment is on on the I think um, the, the one of the earlier um, I think uh, discussion point about fragmentation and and I, I think it's important to to look at why why fragmentation and innovation exist. And um, I'm a business person, so I I've been in this world and working a lot with technical people. I think a lot of times I think fragmentation come out of like a segment of building new technologies without actually knowing why you're building it. And it's not I'm not saying it as a critique. I'm saying it as it happens, right? Even in the business world, it happens. You have an you have an idea like oh this is an amazing idea. And I think it's a business a amazing business idea. But once it get you know further validated, it's probably not the case. So my I think probably this other question for 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 you and um, for you um, uh, it's how how ID Lab is, is is kind of helping kind of like orient the market, and um, because you you talk about earlier like you it's more like oh it's more oh what what is welcome, but at the same time it's it's hard right oh it was welcome right how how um an, an independent nonprofit can play a role of helping and I think formulate your opinions and also help orient the market right with your own opinions and what what what's yeah question for you anything you you've been yeah. Yeah, well, well, I think, you know, transparently, there's a few things like we're a very, you know, new organization, we're about two and two and a half, three years, depending on when you you count the beginning. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things that we've been reflecting on is, you know, we too kind of fall into that trap of, of getting really excited about technology, right? So one, one thing that that we have uh, you know, made a commitment internally is to make sure we really understand the problem and stay in the, in the problem definition phase longer than we are, you know, we typically do. Um, so uh, just, you know, very quickly, the, the leadership team, so Kasana had just joined us as well and, and Matt and also Patrick, who's our CEO, we've been talking about um, 
really listening to the community, wh whether it's through participation or through research, to really identify impact areas that we should stand behind, right? And, and that, that means we have to be selective. And when once we identify those impact areas, we need to um, do the right legwork to find what are the problems that we're in a position to solve, which is sort of in a, in a good segue to, to the next section, which I'm not sure we'll get through. Um, so, so that's our approach in terms of the specific problems. We're not, we're not there yet. We don't have, um, you know, a concrete list yet, but that's something that we, we would be sharing shortly. It's, it's work that we're actively doing. Um, but, you know, again, in a nutshell, it's, it's, it's taking the time to understand the problems and then putting out hypotheses like we are in this conversation, getting feedback to see, you know, are these problems actually worth solving? And do we have a, are we in a position to solve? And if not, who can we engage to solve those things? Um, Patrick. Uh, yeah, just a quick comment uh, regarding the, um, the fragmentation. You know, they, we said, um, that there's positive and negative. I, I think we all know the expression, uh, too many chefs spoiled the broth, you know? Uh, with open source projects, uh, there's people are free to come in and contribute. And the more people that you have, the more difficult it's gonna be to have a consensus to move in a certain way, especially now that there's different actors. Some of them uh, maybe have some kind of goal or agenda, or some maybe they have a, a bit more, um, resources to spend. So it can be very difficult to make projects go forward, which leads to creating different working or community groups. Um, so I think that's, you know, that highlights the, the pros and the cons. And something that I personally found fascinating uh, since I came in the, the field of digital identity, you know, like two years ago, I didn't know much. And uh, I really find fascinating the history behind why certain standards started to evolve or why there was some di divergence at some point. And I think having an insight into that history will be very helpful down the line to come and close this gap maybe that can be created. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Okay, thanks, Patrick. And Keith, your hand is still up. Did you have another point or was that from before? Sorry. I'll... Okay, no problem. So we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so I will try to get into the next section and we'll see how it goes. So so this next part is, is really speaking to one hypothesis that we have um, and and it relates to, you know, what, what we're looking to do, um, you know, based on our, our learning and based on the opportunity that we see. Oops, sorry. Okay, so, you know, we touched on, you know, in the third learning that, you know, while we can't force or dictate, and there's already a lot of great activities out there with, you know, specs and frameworks and standards, like all of those are important. Um, what, what, what are some enablers we can create for the community when it comes to interop? And then when, you know, when, again, this is a bit of a, a, a thinking journey, um, you know, we were thinking, oh, let's start at the end, right? If, you know, uh, imagine a world where there is widespread interoperability, what might that look like? You know, that might look like that there are all these standards that are well established. There might be a consolidation of some of the, you know, all of the, uh, maybe some consolidation of some of the, you know, various technology stacks that have emerged along the way. Um, and, and there is a very robust way of, uh, you know, testing, assessment, certification, et cetera, right? Let's, let's say that it might look like that. But if we work backwards to now, um, you know, how might we get there and what are some things we can leverage, right? So because of our experience working with some of the test suites are out there, you know, we've, we've, we've had, um, collaborators and, and clients, you know, come to us with their um, ask of, you know, being tested, independent testing or, or having tools to help them test or whatever they might be. Um, and then also, if we, if we think about the makeup of our team, we're very small. We're about, I think we're about 12 or 13 people right now. Um, 
you know, at the at the heart of of the lab when it was founded, it was really a very DevOps centric um, organization. And Patrick, for example, is is one of the folks that started with us very early on. So we've we've got that DevOps mindset, that automation mindset, that systems mindset. And then you know, with me and Kasana and and Matt coming on, I bring um, I bring the the product um, mindset. You know, Kasana brings. Um, her her research and her uh, government mindset, and then also um, with Matt, with partnerships and standards and, and and lots of different kind of ingredients to the mix. So so when we when we look at um, what we have on the table, you know, we were further trying to break down this question by looking at you know how might we connect the developer or testers more immediately to testing, right? How do we get them from like zero to sixty? Um, right away, um, how can how might we enable efficient coverage towards a particular test outcome? Right, we know there are test suites, but sometimes they're broken, or sometimes there's missing stuff, or you know, it, it's sort of a, a continuous process. And then in the and then also user experience is really important. How might we package an end-to-end -end user testing journey? Right. So these are kind of some of the questions that we're posing to ourselves. And we think we can do it. So we've started trying to do that. Um, and that's that's what um, the digital trust test bench is that Patrick mentioned earlier. So I just interest of time, I'm not gonna you know provide a specific example because we were gonna talk about kind of the, um, the the Aries agent test harness, which is the use case that we are using to to kind of test out this hypothesis. Um, some of you might be familiar, but happy to cover those details in a separate session. Um, so the thinking here is that if we can remove that barrier for the community who is actually building these solutions and want to achieve interop, um, we're thinking about a cloud-based test bench to facilitate both technical conformity and interop testing. And, and the reason why they're both there is because you kind of need to do the first to be ready for the second. Um, we want this to be a turnkey exper experience with everything under one roof, right? When I say everything, I'm thinking long term, right? Of course, not everything exists, so it can't be everything. But imagine the day when, you know, anybody who is building a technology can just, you know, sign on to the platform and, and be ready to go and be, you know, very well supported. So that's kind of the, that's the vision. And this is something that would be built by the community for the community, right? We would be facilitating it. We would be part of the testing, but it's really kind of for the community, by the community. So I'll show a few slides, not meant to be a full demo. Um, Patrick would be happy to take anyone um, on a, a demo tour when, um, you know, offline, but just to show you a, a sense of it, right? So for example, in the context of uh, enabling a, uh, the Aries agent test harness, and this is particularly Focus on wallets, um, being able to perform the testing that's that's supported by the test harness. Um, you know, we've got a landing page that kind of shows um, some of the dashboard information. Uh, we've got um, a step to configure the testing. So you see, you have uh, environments, you have back channels, you have the tags that you can set to de define the test that you want to run. Um, and then also there's a test execution step, right, where you know, you would be guided through the testing um, steps for with your mobile device. And then also it kind of shows you where you are along the way. Um, and then, of course, in the end, your results would be in in a report um, that is uh, accessible um, either to yourself and in the future uh, could be could be uh, publicized or published to something public. Um, so that's kind of the you know very quick overview of of the the gist of it. Um, we are actively um, working with various folks who have preview access just to play with it for feedback. So it's, it's very much in just a very early stage um, kind of um, um, state um, as a product. It's by no means a commercial product at this point. We really just wanted to take some of the things that we've been hearing from the community and pull together a flow and start to get feedback, right? So very agile, very incremental. Um, and then you might think, okay, that's great. That's a good start. Might wanna play with it. Um, and what are we thinking might be next, right? So when we, so there, there's lots of things that we can do, right? Again, if we are looking for 
a platform that's kind of a one-stop shop that is turnkey, that has coverage, um, that's going to take some time. But what's going to guide our roadmap on what to do next in terms of augmenting the experience or scope of the of the platform is, of course, our pan-Canadian inter pan -Canadian interests. We are very much um, collaborating with um, various provinces who are um, experimenting with um, the Candy Network. I think I think it was Keith or somebody else who had mentioned that earlier. Um, so there's there's a lot of different use cases that are and needs that are coming out of that community. So we would we would definitely look to that as one source of input. And again, conversations like this um, from all of you hearing from the communities, there might be different um, tidbits that we we hear that you know we would explore a little bit more on. Um, and then also, again, because we're a nonprofit, um, you know, we're always looking to align some of these efforts with you know, partnerships um, and also funding opportunities that are out there. So if any of you guys, um, um, especially if you are in nonprofits or, or these types of community groups, if you can give us tips on how we might be able to, um, you know, look for these partnerships or, or funding opportunities, we, we're all years on that. Um, so for now, as I mentioned, we're, we're taking the um, AATH, we're improving the experience and filling the blanks for wallet testing. So that's kind of our base first thin slice. Next, we would be looking at additional mobile scenarios such as issuers or verifiers. So basically broadening the technology coverage. And then later, you know, kind of down the line, we're thinking about things more broadly, right? So if right now we're supporting the developer and the testers um, in, in removing barriers for them, how can we in, um, how can we empower entire product teams, right? And stakeholders supporting these products. Um, how can we enable others to contribute? Um, how can it how can we open things up? Maybe it becomes more like an app store in the future. Like how do people um, contribute to it? And then how might we ensure that there's sustainable care and feeding for the product evolution and scale, right? So again, there's a little bit of um, thinking around upkeep, et cetera, down the line, but I think that's a little bit further. We're kind of still in early stages. Uh, Kalia. Yeah, hi. Um, I was gonna ask this question the last time you paused and I didn't get the chance to. It is like, I think, you know, I was just in Canada last week at the DIAC and Identity North meetings and, um, you know, a question that came to mind as you were presenting too about this kind of like, well, there's lots of different interoperability communities potentially. Um, and I just, I'm wondering if it's, you know, if acceptance of credentials outside Canada is an important thing to be considering. Like it's one thing to get Canada to potentially cross our fingers, maybe align with itself. But if that alignment is a choice, that means those credentials that Canadians currently share when they cross borders aren't accepted because people in other countries aren't using those cryptographic, don't have the capabilities to do the cryptographic verification on their credentials what does that mean right mm -hmm. yep i i don't have the answer to that but that's definitely something that we would you know bring forward and discuss with with our you know gc collaboration partners i could maybe chip in a bit uh, to this if that's all right uh, i think like there's a active challenge now like first is obviously being interoperable within Canada because I think this comes from a use case of one thing to do things more efficiently and differently within uh, I think the cross-border um, not necessarily a later problem because it, it will arise but I'm think the best way to do it is in the selection of the technology now make sure it's a technology that can be extensive um, and I think it's interesting to see what's happening uh, in the EU um, because they face these challenges the most because they have 
different countries and they need to implement a solution that's interoperable. So uh, I think it will probably be something to to make sure that will be fixed at some point. But I, I don't think it should be a limiting factor in the short term uh, adoption. That would be my my take on that. Yeah, I think it's a it's a question of roadmap and, and it's definitely a point that needs to be considered when defining that roadmap, right? What what are the priorities? Is it about solving internal, you know, going back to the boundaries? Is it is it within that boundary or is there a need to um, look broadly and when, right? So I think those are all great questions that will need to be decided upon. Um, okay, so I think I'm actually at the end. Um, so thank you everyone for your time and, and for all of the insightful questions and comments. We really appreciate the, co the conversation. It's, it's really valuable to us. Um, so if you have any follow-up questions or you're interested in chatting more, or if you want to zoom in on a particular thing that we've touched on, we, we'd be happy to continue the conversation. My contacts are there. And also, if you see an opportunity to, to um, collaborate with us for whatever reason, whether it's interop or other things, feel free to reach out. If you like a demo of what we've done so far with the test bench, you can um, email interop at idlab.org and Patrick will definitely pick that up and set up some time with you. There's another oh. Patrick at the uh, ID Lab. Uh, that's that's <laughs> not me. <laughs> cool. Well, this is going to be you. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. I'll pass it back to you, Dan. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Uh, thank you, everybody else from the ID Lab team. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, and also everybody for participating in the discussion. It was super informative for me. Um, but yeah, I think with that, we'll go ahead and call it for today. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.